are the things that the I want to be Um, I had to remember that for women, men are strangers. And this hasn't really been mentioned that much in the, during the time we've been together, so I felt that it was something to bring up. The, the, um, the, first of all, that the, the world of power and men stands around us as we enter in as women, and then we produce children who are also strangers as they're born, as the baby as the stranger. So the woman is the sort of astonished figure in the middle of the world, to me, I'm watching these risings of power and strangeness around her. And um, so I was going to read this poem um, that brought that up for me because the experience of being in Russia, which is a very macho culture, had brought up. And the, the thing at the end I mentioned is the Theotokos, which is the, um, the icon of the Mother of God, which everybody I'm sure has seen, the Russian icon of the brown-faced Madonna with her baby. Um, so it ends with that, but the rest of it is nothing there. So it's called After Watching Klimov's Agonia, which is a a movie made by L.M. Klimov, who's not a well-known but a great Russian filmmaker. And he wrote, uh, he made a film also um, as I'm making this little film <laughs> based on the life of Rasputin. The peasant crosses from the farm to a train and enters a tunnel to the palace. The future watches him coming like a child whose doll falls from her hands when the living approach. Ultimately, he will be autopsied by nihilists who act like God and photograph his corpse. The state goes on with its grim task of arresting its critics. Find me a person, any person, and I will find a way to discredit him. What was alcohol for a peasant was heroin for Stalin. The photographs of Rasputin's face make me wish I could meet him and vomit. They are like unwrapped gauzes imprinted with mummies, his voracious gaze, his wild hair. They poisoned his cake and wine and shot him and shot him twice. But he wouldn't die, so they tossed him through a hole in the frozen river. When the police found him, his arms were raised to lift the ice. People dropped buckets in that superhuman water and drank, without an element of atheism. No religion can be credible. A black frost dapples his face and torso. They pickled his lingam. It was so long they wanted to watch it. He started life as a poor agrarian boy who got in trouble with the authorities. Then he had a vision and walked from Siberia to Mount Athos. Now he represents a question. What makes one person unable to inhabit his, his own skin? Once there was metaphysical socialism, call it Christianity or Gnosticism. Images of munitions and wolves were sewn into his vestments. Because he was unself, uncultivated, he was dangerous a serf, a monk, and a drunk, haunting the royal family. We have to face reality. We are glad we were born in the West. There we said it. Shame of embourgeoisement covers us. Shame on behalf of the women and children who defended their city, digging trenches in snow. Tarkovsky's Ivan, 
who lived in rooms smelling of wood and urine, garlic, salt, and black bread for supper. The fountains play at the Western Palace from 8 to 5 p.m. The spouts work on a system of gravity that God or someone invented. This discovering will become important to missile development. What went wrong when we were young? We had friends who became enemies of the state with us, students who turned into deserters, then returned to capitalism. All was forgiven. So what did we fail to do then? Carry through. Reconstruction was the next ideology. Proud-bellied white men from the West got the last laugh. Since the invention of the laptop, Disconnected figures flow from discarded works. Phrases are resurrected. Isn't this blasphemy like showing a saint in ballet tights? When these four words, you look well fed, are said, you are doomed by your revolutionary companions. You have no right to complain having chosen to seek a piece of the pleasure. Some moments in history last too long. They could have been whims, but they became plans. Beauty is a despised agent for religion under these conditions. I open my eyes and can't hear a word from the days of rebellion. But when I close them, I hear continuing revolution. The spoils of a lost war all wars dry up into scabs, have turned libraries upside down, and texts are turned into clips. Every old misery holds interest. Father got worried when I went to the far left and called me self-indulgent. Mother laughed when I became a Catholic. She didn't believe it. I left the blackened house and walked in the dark, throwing ballast overboard for the sake of a future of solitariness. To the seeker, all objects are lonely and dangerous. Great films begin in chaos. They are made in order to show the abyss emerging into laws. Like Pope John Paul, certain directors only want the splendor of truth. Turgenev wonders if it's possible that all the tears and prayers of people can be fruitless. No, he protests. The indifference of nature is a foretaste of eternity and its mercy. On the steps of the Czech Embassy in London, there is a splash of bird ship. I sit beside it, reassembling the bits of sound for this poem. Words know everything. That's why my fingers shake. Nietzsche was a saint, but he made a mistake. He believed in humanity. Almost everything in that cafe is weaker than the air that surrounds it. Glasses hang upside down drying. A mirror reflects the room like an artist who is blind to what she is making. The operation of a Gnostic is pure sex, but love apes its way through the interstices sticks there like a dent in an inchworm's back. You can't take it out because it's the thing itself. Love is the green in green. Does this explain its pain? Since love came over and knocked me down, then kicked me in the side and fled, I have suffered from a prolonged perplexity. God is the object of my wonder and the closest to me especially near sleep. My sheets are like the wings of a guardian angel. There is no other fabric so near to my feelings. I haunt a dark cathedral, its single light coming from the gift shop, and follow the priest's movements. For here is the truth, both worldly and eternal, a heart of gold in the roaring vault. Here a weeping Madonna is kissed all day while an old woman wipes away the stain with a gray cloth. The mass is focused on the resurrection, not the passion. 
In this place, a grandmother is called white if she has healing powers. Rasputin had the power in his hands. Yet Akhmatova shared a train compartment with him and felt faint looking at his pale eyes. Each iris in either eye saw around the pupil. I feel sick looking at the photos of his eyes, his penis, his beard and blood. Violent, skinhead, racist, nationalist, sexist, illiterate men would appreciate him for the wrong reason. Rasputin played dog and crawled into the royal dining room. You smell like a mushroom, he barked and called on Jesus to bless the soldiers who refused to kill the workers. He was like a dry root in motion. Women loved him and let him achieve ecstasy on top of them. This was his Gnostic and Tantric obsession. He lived without hate. He could stop a migraine with his hands and was seen praying in a forest for hours on end and by his bed alone. If only he had never taken up wine. Now the children climb over the rails around the station. The siege of renovation raised them, blocks and forests raised and built on, cement units they can't afford to live in. The kids have behaved like spawn born to be the end of the line, or not fully born, porn-driven thugs, mafiosi, right-wing Christians. Only hope can save them or an invasion by Muslims or oceans. Who are dubbed the new stupids? The workers. The revolutionists were long ago strung up and the old did not survive the cold. You could write music on the water lines around their flooded tenements. The peasant mocks, mocked institutions that Ratzinger would prize. It was the student uprising of 68 that turned him against the left. Nowadays, in every bureaucracy, including the Vatican, there are two of everything, of everyone, sorry. Two of each who look exactly alike. It's the softness in the chin that undefines them. Each one is the half-brother of a twin. Likewise, communism is secular Christianity. Either you fear or thank someone and stay anonymous. One poet recreated a new language out of his nanny's fireside stories. This way his childhood survived, the way dinosaurs become birds. While painting takes time and gives headaches, a digital camera doesn't blink, and this produces a lack of analogies. It's not an open eye, but an impure certainty. Empty frames stand waiting under the stairs. They wait for a thought that carried Dante with it, a long and difficult thought, full of stains and imperfect figures, suffering and acid rain. Don't plan any parties for Lent, a man called up in Italian. And in the dream, the shutter kept opening and closing like an anemone. Each hour was the same as the one before. The roads we did not choose began in a town where we were born. Here a gun might go off, there perhaps a broom would brush away the sticks of spring. It was not your fault where you were dropped or where you took your first steps, the red church down the lane, the red sail on the bay. These had nothing to do with you when you first arrived on earth. A peasant might prefer smoking weed to whacking at wheat all day. How else would a vision find and know him? In a remote fishing village and on its wet stone steps, the clink of the ropes and rings on the boats was the only sound, then footsteps. The sun broke through onto buses and houses. High up, a man and a woman, both old and on their own, crossed paths without looking. Then she noticed him and he her. A hurried exchange of recollections followed and half promises to meet some day. And then he continued to mount the side of the hill to his house while she went down to the highway. Absolutely nothing happened except recognition that left an ache. 
Each wore the face of the Theotokos when the icon is shut away. Default mode. They were living in America at another time. They were living in America for the FBI. They were living in America shit wins. They were living in America on the border with Canada. They were living in America further gone into teats. They were living in America that was the only good one. They were living in America that was the only good one. They were living in America who answers the phone and. They were living in America deliriously. They were living in America sadly. They were living in America fictitiously. They were living in America wedged. They were living in America Stella by starlight. They were living in America the mighty sun. They were living in America pandemically. They were living in America across from the Ritz Hotel. They were living in America getting their chops. They were living in America only for just one summer. They were living in America beside the lake. They were living in America for the defeatist troops. They were living in America for the pleasure of it all. They were living in America as well as can be expected. They were living in America as one grows passionately out of a love affair. They were living there every day. Does this donut remind you of a life preserver? They were living in America to remind you of me. They were living in America and a storm blew up suddenly. They were living in America extended terms of credit. They were living in America but it's all over. They were living in America as tissue paper is to a comb. They were living in America at fives and sixes. They were living in America the same old, same old. And uh, this last poem is called The Cowboy. Someone has spread an elaborate rumor about me that I was in possession of an extraterrestrial being. And I thought I knew who it was. It was Roger Lawson. Roger was a black practical joker of the worst sort. And up till now, I had, I had not been one of his victims. So I kind of knew my time had come. People parked in front of my house for hours and took pictures. I had to draw my blinds and only went out when I had to. Then there was a barrage of questions. What does he look like? What do you feed him? How did you capture him? And I simply denied the presence of an extraterrestrial in my house. And of course, this excited them all the more. The press showed up and started creeping around my yard. It got to be very irritating. More and more came and parked up and down the street. Roger was really working overtime on this one. I had to do something. Finally, finally I made an announcement. I said, the little fellow died peacefully in his sleep at 11.02 last night. Let us see the body, they clamored. He went up and smoked instantly, I said. I don't believe you, one of them said. There is nobody in the house where I would have buried him myself, I said. About half of them got in their cars and drove off. The rest of them kept their vigil, but more solemnly now. I went and bought some groceries. When I came back, about a half an hour later, half of them had gone. When I went into the kitchen, I nearly dropped the groceries. There was a nearly transparent fellow with large pink eyes standing about three feet tall. Why did you tell them I was dead? <laughs> that was a lie, he said. You speak English, I said. I listened to the radio. It wasn't very hard to learn. Also, we have television. We get all your channels. I like cowboys, especially John Ford movies. They're the best. What, he said, what am I going to do with you, I said. Take me to meet a real cowboy. That would make me happy, he said. I don't know any real cowboys, but maybe we could find one. 
people will go crazy if they see you. We'd have press following us everywhere. It would be the story of this century, I said. I can be invisible. It's not hard for me to do, he said. I'll think about it. Wyoming or Montana would be the best bet. But they're a long way from here, I said. Please, I won't cause you any trouble, he said. It would take some planning, I said. I put the groceries down and started putting them away. I tried not to think of the cosmic meaning of all this. Instead, I treated him like a smart little kid. Do you have any sarsaparilla, he said. <coughs> no, but I have some orange juice. It's good for you, I said. He drank it and made a face. I'm going to get the maps out, I said. We'll see how we could get there. When I came back, he was dancing on the kitchen table, a sort of ballet, but very sad. I have the maps, I said. We won't need them. I just received word. I'm going to die tonight. It's really a joyous occasion, and I hope you'll help me celebrate by watching the Magnificent Seven, he said. I stood there and with the maps in my hands, I felt an unbearable sadness come over me. Why must you die, I said. Father decides these things. It's probably my, re my reward for coming here safely and meeting you, he said. But I was going to take you to meet a real cowboy, I said. Let's pretend you are my, you are my real cowboy, he said. Uh, this next poem is a, a one long sentence, so you have to sort of hang on for it to make any sense at all. Um, it has two sort of plots. One is a, a plot that is in parentheses um, and describes it maybe a 20-year journey, and then the other plot is just the, the fact of a duck crashing into a bedroom. Um, and the poem is called Homosexuality. First I saw the round bill like a bud. Then the sooty crested head with avernal eyes flickering distressed. Then the peculiar long neck wrapping and unwrapping itself like pity or love when I removed the stovepipe cover of the bedroom chimney to free what was there and a duck crashed into the room. I am here in this fallen state, hitting her face, bending her throat back. My love, my inborn turbid wanting at large all night, backing away, gnawing at her own wing linings, the poison of my life, the beast, the wolf, leaping out the window, which I held open, now clear, sane, serene, before climbing back naked into bed with you. This is a different kind of relationship to the encounter with the other. It takes place in the background of this poem um, in which the words St. Paul appear. Um, obviously, the encounter, um, the conversion on the road to Damascus is present underneath the poem, even though the poet James Wright is referring to St. Paul, Paul, Minnesota. Um, you will notice when God appears in the poem, you will notice when the Sioux Indian appears in the poem and the encounter is between a white man and a man whose land was taken from him in its entirety um, at a bus stop, on a road, on a journey in which a conversion takes place. Um, it's an extraordinary relationship between two strangers and um, one of the things that the, you want to think about 
so I was going off the word monster in the last poem is what is monstrous in this poem. Um, the poem is titled Hook. There's a man in it um, who has a hook. Usually we think of that as monstrous. Um, you have to think about when the verb, I think, hunting appears in the poem, you know, the tradition of hunting and being hunted and what hospitality is when strangers meet on a road, why Zeus, for example, is the god of hospitality and how essential it is when strangers meet historically, uh, literally, culturally, um, that certain transactions take place. Um, so a poem with a lot going on behind it, which I think you will get. Hook. I was only a young man in those days. On that evening, the cold was so goddamned bitter, there was nothing, nothing. I was in trouble with a woman, and there was nothing. Nothing there but me and dead snow. I stood on the street corner in Minneapolis, lashed this way and that. Wind rose from some pit, hunting me. Another bus to St. Paul would arrive in three hours if I was lucky. Then the young Sue loomed beside me. His scars were just my age. Ain't got no bus here a long time, he said. You got enough money to get home on? What did they do to your hand, I answered. He raised up his hook into the terrible starlight and slashed the wind. Oh, that, he said. I had a bad time with a woman. Here, you take this. Did you ever feel a man hold 65 cents in a hook and place it gently into your freezing hand. I took it. It wasn't the money I needed, but I took it. I love the way the pit turns into the palm, in that palm. And this, this uh, gesture of James Wright, he always uses these American phrases like, you take this, which could be an act of violence. And he uses it inside out. I'm going to read an elegy to my father, who is really a stranger to me. I thought I knew him a little when he was alive. Um, but I certainly found out after he died that I didn't know him at all. Although this elegy was written when I thought I knew something about him. It's in six sections. One, the empty body. The hands were yours, the arms were yours, but you were not there. The eyes were yours, but they were closed and would not open. The distant sun was there. The moon poised on the hill's white shoulder was there. The wind on Bedford Basin was there. The pale green light of winter was there. Your mouth was there, but you were not there. When somebody spoke, there was no answer. Clouds came down and buried the buildings along the water, and the water was silent. The gulls stared. The years, the hours that would not find you turned in the wrists of others. There was no pain. It had gone. There were no secrets. 
There was nothing to say. The shade scattered its ashes. The body was yours, but you were not there. The air shivered against its skin. The dark leaned into its eyes, but you were not there. Two answers. Why did you travel? Because the house was cold. Why did you travel? Because it is what I have always done between sunset and sunrise. What did you wear? I wore a blue suit, a white shirt, yellow tie, and yellow socks. What did you wear? I wore nothing. A scarf of pain kept me warm. Who did you sleep with? I slept with a different woman each night. Who did you sleep with? I slept alone. I've always slept alone. Why did you lie to me? I always thought I told the truth. Why did you lie to me? Because the truth lies like nothing else and I love the truth. Why are you going? Because nothing means much to me anymore. Why are you going? I don't know. I have never known. How long shall I wait for you? Do not wait for me. I am tired and I want to lie down. Are you tired and do you want to lie down? Yes, I am tired and I want to lie down. Three, you're dying. Nothing could stop you. Not the best day, not the quiet, not the ocean rocking. You went on with your dying. Not the trees under which you walked, not the trees that shaded you, not the doctor who warned you, the white-haired young doctor who saved you once. You went on with your dying. Nothing could stop you, not your son, not your daughter who fed you and made you into a child again, not your son who thought you would live forever, not the wind that shook your lapels, not the stillness that offered itself to your emotion, not your shoes that grew heavier, not your eyes that refused to look ahead. Nothing could stop you. You sat in your room and stared at the city and went on with your dying. You went to work and let the cold enter your clothes. You let blood seep into your socks. Your face turned white. Your voice cracked in two. You leaned on your cane, but nothing could stop you. Not your friends who gave you advice, not your son, not your daughter who watched you grow small, not fatigue that lived in your size, not your lungs that would fill with water, not your sleeves that carried the pain of your arms. Nothing could stop you. You went on with your dying. When you played with children, you went on with your dying. When you sat down to eat, when you woke up at night wet with tears, your body sobbing, you went on with your dying. Nothing could stop you, not the past, not the future with its good weather, not the view, the view from your window, the view of the graveyard, not the city, not the terrible city with its wooden buildings, not defeat, not success. You did nothing but go on with your dying. You put your watch to your ear. You felt yourself slipping. You lay on the bed. You folded your arms over your chest and you dreamed of the world without you, of the space under the trees, of the space in your room, of the spaces that would now be empty of you. And you went on with your dying. Nothing could stop you, not your breathing, 
not your life, not the life you wanted, not the life you had. Nothing could stop you. Four, your shadow. You have your shadow. The places where you were have given it back. The hallways and bare lawns of the orphanage have given it back. The newsboy's home has given it back. The streets of New York have given it back. And so have the streets of Montreal. The rooms in Belen where lizards would snap at mosquitoes have given it back. The dark streets of Manaus and the damp streets of Rio have given it back. Mexico City, where you wanted to leave it, has given it back. And Halifax, where the harbor would wash its hands of you, has given it back. You have your shadow. The doorways you entered lifted your shadow from you, and when you went out, gave it back. You had your shadow. Even when you forgot your shadow, you found it again. It had been with you. Once in the country, the shade of a tree covered your shadow, and you were not known. Once in the country, you thought your shadow had been cast by somebody else. Your shadow said nothing. Your clothes carried your shadow inside. When you took them off, it spread like the dark of your past. And your words that float like leaves in an air that is lost in a place no one knows gave you back your shadow. Your friends gave you back your shadow. Your enemies gave you back your shadow. They said it was heavy and would cover your grave. When you died, your shadow slept at the mouth of the furnace and ate ashes for bread. It rejoiced among ruins. It watched while others slept. It shone like crystal among the tombs. It composed itself like air. It wanted to be like snow on water. It wanted to be nothing, but that was not possible. It came to my house. It sat on my shoulders. Your shadow is yours. I told it so. I said it was yours. I have carried it with me too long. I give it back. Five. Mourning. They mourn for you when you rise at midnight and the dew glitters on the stone of your cheeks. They mourn for you. They lead you back into the empty house. They carry the chairs and tables inside. They sit you down and teach you to breathe. And your breath burns. It burns the pine box and the ashes fall like sunlight. They give you a book and tell you to read. They listen and their eyes fill with tears. The women stroke your fingers. They comb the yellow back into your hair. They shave the frost from your beard. They knead your thighs. They dress you in fine clothes. They rub your hands to keep them warm. They feed you. They offer you money. They get on their knees and beg you not to die. When you rise at midnight, they mourn for you. They close their eyes and whisper your name over and over. But they cannot drag the buried light from your veins. Old man, rise and keep rising. It does no good. They mourn for you the way they can. In the sixth and last section called the New Year, it is winter and the new year. Nobody knows you. Away from the stars, from the rain of light, you lie under the weather of stones. There is no thread to lead you back. Your friends doze in the dark of pleasure and cannot remember. Nobody knows you. You are the neighbor of nothing. You do not see the rain falling and the man walking away, the soiled wind blowing its ashes across the city. 
You do not see the sun dragging the moon like an echo. You do not see the bruised heart go up in flames. The skulls of the innocent turn into smoke. You do not see the scars of plenty, the eyes without light. It is over. It is winter and the new year. The meek are hauling their skins into heaven. The hopeless are suffering the cold with those who have nothing to hide. It is over and nobody knows you. There is starlight drifting on the black water. There are stones in the sea no one has seen. There is a shore and people are waiting and nothing comes back because it is over, because there is silence instead of a name, because it is winter and the new year. The subject or the title is Hosting the Stranger. Who is stranger than ourselves? You know, to be alive means hosting a stranger, right? We are hosting the stranger. So I read three of them and this will be this will be it. The first one is a little older but And it's just called self-portrait. Between the computer, a pencil, and a typewriter, half my day passes. One day, it will be half a century. I live in strange cities and sometimes talk with strangers about matters strange to me. I listen to music a lot, Bach, Mahler, Chopin, Shostakovich. I see three elements in music, weakness, power, and pain. The force has no name. I read poets, living and dead, who teach me tenacity, faith, and pride. I try to understand the great philosophers, but usually catch just scraps of their precious thoughts. I like to take long walks on Paris streets and watch my fellow creatures quickened by envy, anger, desire, to trace a silver coin passing from hand to hand as it slowly loses its round shape. The emperor's profile is erased. Beside me, trees expressing nothing but a green, indifferent perfection. Black birds pace the fields, waiting passionately like Spanish widows. I'm no longer young, but someone else is always older. I like deep sleep when I cease to exist, and fast bike rides on country roads when poplars and houses dissolve like cumuli on sunny days. Sometimes in museums the paintings speak to me and irony suddenly vanishes. I laugh gazing at my wife's face. Every Sunday I call my father. Every other week I meet with friends, thus proving my fidelity. My country freed itself from one evil. I wish another liberation would follow. Could I help in this? I don't know. I'm truly not a child of the ocean, as Antonio Machado wrote about himself, but a child of air, mint, and cello, and not all the ways of the high world cross paths with the life that, so far, belongs to me. <clears throat> I'm going to close with two poems. Uh, the first is called, it's in eight parts, very small parts, uh, about six lines um, per section. And uh, it's written using the journals of Georg Trockel, 
uh, a stranger, perhaps the strangest. And uh, I think everything's pretty self-explanatory in the poem. He did apprentice as an apothecary in, um, in a place called the White Angel. And he was unable to read people's faces. It was something that faced him his whole brief life. He died at 27. Um, he couldn't fathom a look or a response. Eight takes of Trockel as himself. One, of that which makes a child blanch in sleep. Frost voluptuous, put down too early. Eavesdrop on the bell tolls, mignonettes. What is it compels you to linger in the precincts of the hours when domesticated creatures well know how by heart to sleep? Silver fishing, household gods. Two, acquisition of the pronoun I. He was bashful as Li Po, reaching from his small butter-colored boat to touch the image of the moon eventually. Gloom is pre-articulate. Three, dementia precox, aged five, found unconscious in a pile of snow on a bowler hat shaped hill outside a Salzburg, half frozen in the heap of it. The other half, his sister, Marguerite, her hair, the dark plain of a harpsichord, her face an autumn day so brazen it is gold. Apprentice apples ripen in an azure bowl. Four, the quiet God close his blue eyes over him. His wish to cast himself where chestnut-colored horses raised their hooves against the sky. Five, to the stars a physiognomy. He had never read the face of any soul, the mouth a dim red light, the eye to him an apothecary jar splayed by silver implements. Stars are maiden monks in churchyards at St. Peter's, led by wild wishing wolves back home. Six, always the self will be black and near. A sister's ruddy skirt rustles like a cave entered for the first time by a human kind. He was in love with her, such as it is to live in the same room within an unintended deaths. As a sleepwalker, he was precocious, hereabouts pricked with constant pharmaceuticals. Seven, the white angel. What is it compels you to rearrange the blown glass bottles in the windows of a dusking hall. Cyanine, half-born, his own father was not his own. Green, the land of ghosts extinguishing the cool rooms of a hospital. Red barges floating on the tips of madder ponds. Amber, a semblance of the ancient Chinese poet face down in the plow of ochre reeds at night. Eight, it is a light that goes out in my mouth. Of the dear dead, how beautiful it was to walk with you in the misbegotten shadows of the blue deer huddle grazing in the frisk of misbelief by day with you. So the world is waiting for Obama, my barber said. 
and the old fences in the village street and the flowers brimming over the rusted zinc fences all acquired a sheen like a visible sigh. And indoors, in the small barber shop, an election poster joined another showing all the various hairstyles available to his young black clients that cost the same no matter who you were, President of the U.S. Head smooth as a bowling ball, my barber smiles. Is that a Muslim or African name, Obama? Benign and gentle with his swift snipping scissors, I wish him luck. And luck waits in each gable-shadowed street that leads to the beach. Popo loves politics. Once in the glass there were photos of Malcolm, King, Garvey, Frederick, Douglas frowning in the breadfruit window. Also the yapping dogs, the hoses, the church in Alabama. Popo is young, <coughs> black, bald under his baseball cap. But more than a barber, he is delicate, adept. And when I leave his throne, shake shown hair from my lap, I feel changed like an election promise that is kept. <laughs>